Hello, my name is Tim Shearage. Welcome to this video and welcome to my thoughts on the Behringer System 55. Now that track that I just played you there, that was all System 55 modules apart from one single module and that module was to provide some reverb. Uh, this is the case of modules I was using. I don't know if you can see that. And in fact, I wasn't even using all of these modules either. I was just using a, a small number of them. There are so many modules in this System 55 collection, I'm absolutely blown away at the choice that Beringer have provided us. Uh, there are, I think, about 22 different modules, though I'm not 100% sure because I can't find a definitive answer to how many modules there are in the collection right now. Uh, it's 22 that I'm aware of, put it that way. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to run through as quickly as I can those 22 modules what they are and briefly what they do. Now, this is not gonna be tutorial of those modules. I just don't have enough time. There are too many modules and I have too little time. So I maybe I'll do in the future some videos where I pick on some individual modules or small collections of modules and go into some details about how to use them. Uh, but for this video, I'm really just gonna give you a brief, brief description of what's available in the collection that I know about. So that's what's coming up next. Right, so let's take a look at these 22 modules. We'll start off with oscillators and see what choices we have. First up is this module here, it's the 921. It's a general purpose oscillator. It can also act as a LFO. And the other choice we have is actually a pair of modules. It's a 921A and 921B. The 921A is an oscillator driver. Um, and the 91Bs are labeled as oscillators. Now, basically what happens with these is that you can daisy chain multiple oscillators, multiple 921Bs up to your 921A. The 921A is handling the master pitch. It's also handling the pulse width of the square wave. Um, and the 91Bs are handling the rest of the, sort of the duties of an oscillator. Right, so moving on to filters, we've got quite a choice here. So first up is the 904A module. This is the classic transistor ladder filter, the 24 dB four pole low pass filter, that wonderful Moog sound. Um, it's got three control inputs at the bottom for CV control of the cutoff. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, resonance control isn't called resonance, it's called regeneration on these old modules. And the high pass equivalent is the 904B. Uh, again, it's got the three control inputs at the bottom and you'll notice that there is no resonance control on this high pass filter, unfortunately. Third choice is the 923. Now this has got a low pass filter and a high pass filter all on one module, but they're very simple filters. There's no resonance control on either of the filters and there are no control voltage inputs, so you can't modulate the cutoffs of either of these filters. Uh, but what you do get is a little section at the bottom there called noise source, and you've got two outputs for white noise and two outputs for pink. And here's the fourth choice of filter module. It is the 914 fixed filter bank. It's a classic and iconic filter module from Moog recreated here by Behringer. You've got a low pass filter and a high pass filter on board. And then you have these 12 separate band pass filters set at different frequencies. Okay, so we've looked at oscillators and filters. Now let's have a look at amplifiers. Well, in fact, there's just one module. It's the 902. Uh, not a lot to say about this module, to be honest. It's got three control inputs at the bottom. You have a switch where you can choose between linear and exponential as to how it behaves to those control voltages. Uh, the signal in can be inverted as well as the signal out. Right, so let's move on to envelope generators. There is one module, it's the 911. Now this is a standard attack, decay, sustain, release envelope generator, but you won't see the words attack, decay, sustain, or release written on it at all. Uh, it's a bit more scientific than that. We have T1, T2, T3, and E sus. So T1 is the attack time, T2 is the decay time, T3 is the release time, and the bottom control is E sus, that is the sustain level. So it's not in the same order as a regular ADSR envelope generator that you you might be used to using. Uh, it does catch you out until you get used to it. Um, one thing to mention there is that in terms of being able to give this module a gate or a trigger, 
uh, it's labeled S trig in. Now I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right now about it, uh, but what you will, will notice with these modules is you'll see labels S trig and you'll see labels V trig. V trig is the equivalent of standard Eurorack trigger and gate voltages. S trig is something completely different. If you were to plug a Eurorack gate or trigger into this S trig, it would not behave the way you would expect it to at all. Um, so there are some other supporting modules that I'm going to mention right now uh, relating to this S trig. Here's the first of those modules. It's the 961. It's called the interface. It's a large module. It does a number of things, um, but one of the duties that it does have is to take in a V trig, or in fact, a bunch of V trigs if you want to, and supply an S trig output. It's actually got two of those circuits uh, for doing this. So it can convert basically Eurorack triggers and gates into S trig uh, gates that uh, the envelope generator module understands. And while we're talking about modules that need S trig, let's mention the other one, the 911A. This is called a dual trigger delay. It's a very nice little module for some interesting effects. It takes a trigger and then it delays the output of that trigger by up to about 10 seconds. So it's a really interesting delay for giving you a, a delay effect in terms of triggers. There are actually two of those delays on this module and they can be run either as parallel or in series. So it's an interesting delay for some very interesting effects, but it does require S trigs just the same as the 911 envelope generator does. So that's why I'm mentioning it now. And one more module to mention while we're talking about S trig is this new module here from Behringer. Uh, it's not strictly a System 55 module, but they've done it in the, in the in the same livery as the rest of them. It looks very very smart alongside them. It's called the CM1A. It's a MIDI to CV converter. Uh, but the beauty of this particular MIDI to CV converter is that it can output V trigs and S trigs. Uh, so it's a very handy module to use if you're using MIDI keyboard or sequencer uh, and you want to trigger your envelope generators in your System 55 collection. Right, so moving on, just a couple of sort of like uh, miscellaneous modules to talk about now. This is the 903A module. Uh, it's just, uh, it's called Random Signal Generator and that sounds very posh. Um, but basically it's just a noise generator. There are two outputs for white noise and there are two outputs for pink noise. Uh, now there was a noise generation on one of the filter modules that I mentioned earlier, but if you just want the noise on its own, then this is a very slim little module that does that. There is no sample and hold. I'll talk about some of the limitations of these modules and this collection later on, but there is no sample and hold circuit. So if you're thinking random signal generator will be a sample and hold circuit, it's not. It's just purely noise and nothing more than that. Here's another miscellaneous module to mention, a little one. It's called the CP1A um, and it's a power supply. Uh, they're really, really useful, these things. They're so cheap as well. If you've got an unpowered case or you're thinking of buying an unpowered case for your Eurorack gear, then you're going to need a little module such as this one that you can put into the front and then behind it will be the ribbon cables that will give you the power supply for your other modules in that case. Um, and I'm mentioning it now because uh, it's really, really useful. It's kind of part of the... Um, the System 55 range, although it's not strictly a System 55 module, but it's got the same sort of like uh, faceplate as the other modules. And it's very, very useful. Right, so let's move on to modules that are going to do uh, signal processing and voltage processing. The first of them here is the CP3A-M. It's a mixer module. Uh, you've got four uh, inputs with attenuators, um, and you can get either a summed output or inverted summed output. There's also a couple of multiple circuits in there as well. Very, very useful. I mean, if you're going to have multiple oscillators, then you're going to need to mix them together before you then pass them onto your filter. Uh, and this is exactly what you're going to need. One of these modules, the CP3A-M. 
Now talking of multiples, if you want multiples on their own, then here is the 994. These are passive multiples, they're, they're not uh, buffered multiples, uh, but you get two multiple circuits there. The other utility module that you're gonna need a lot of is attenuators, and here is a 995 module. It's got three attenuators on it. Very, very useful, you're gonna need those a lot. And while we're on the subject of attenuators, here is another module that has attenuators. It's the CP35. You get four attenuators on this particular module. You also get two multiple circuits and you have some fixed voltages, which can be very useful. There's a minus six volts and a plus six volts. Here are two more modules that do control voltage processing. The CP3A-O, otherwise known as the oscillator controller, and the 992, otherwise known as the control voltages module. Both these modules look very, very similar, as you can see, which is why I put them together here. The only real difference is the module on the left has a regular attenuator, and the module on the right has an attenuverter. It can go negative as well as positive. Uh, but both these modules, basically what they do is they take up to four control voltage inputs, they sum those control voltages together, and then they supply those control voltages summed with three outputs each. Um, and they do that with a high level of accuracy in terms of those voltages. The CP3A-O is really designed to take control voltages and then supply them to oscillators uh, so that there's no loss of uh, accuracy in terms of pitch. Um, and then the 992, its real use is for supplying control voltages to filters. Two final modules to mention, the 960 sequential controller. It's a massive uh, module, I have to say, uh, but very, very iconic. Uh, it's got three sequences on board, uh, up to eight steps each. Uh, it's not quantized, as was the case with all sequences back in the day. Um, and you can sort of link those sequences up to create up to 24 steps in one single sequence if you want to, and that's what the sequential switch is for.
So some people might consider uh, mixing up some Behringer clones of Moog modules with actual Moog cases and a Mother 32. They might consider that to be blasphemy. Uh, but to be honest with you, it works really, really well. I'm having loads and loads of fun with these modules here. What I've got here basically is a couple of oscillators, a single low pass filter, and a couple of envelope generators. And there's lots of ways to patch it up with the Mother 32. Uh, it's a lot of fun this way. Um, I mean, I've gone through a number of iterations. Uh, I bought my um, System 55 modules uh, January this year. So we're talking about, you know, eight, nine months ago. Um, and I bought them in a big uh, bearing a go case. So everything in one big case. And I've been sort of like going through sort of like my ideas about how, how I might want to use these modules, the best way for me to use these modules. And what I've found is, for me personally, the best way is to have more focused uh, setups than just everything in one great big case. So here I've got a couple of oscillators, a couple of envelope generators and a filter. It works really well for me. Um, and with my tip-top audio case that I showed you earlier, there are three uh, oscillators in that particular case. So it's a sort of a classic three oscillator mono synth setup in that one. Uh, and that's sort of like a process that I've gone through over a period of many months, figuring out the best ways that I want to use these modules. And as I've been going through that process, I've been sort of drawing up a list of positives and negatives with these modules, uh, which I'm going to basically share with you in this video. I'm gonna actually show you the list that I came up with on the screen right now. As you can see, there's quite a lot more negatives than positives. I mean, by negatives, I mean just things to think about, really. Uh, if you're going to invest your money in this collection of modules, then I think, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, there are some things that I know about now that I didn't know right at the beginning, and that's what I want to share with you in this video. So basically what I'm going to do with the rest of this video is go through my positives and negatives list, item by item, uh, tell you why I've written those particular items, uh, I'll give you some examples, and, and I think that's probably the best way for me to utilize my time with the remainder of this video. So I don't know about you, but when someone mentions Moog Modular to me, I immediately think of Tangerine Dream and of images like these ones. Those huge cabinets filled with modules. And look at those 960 modules. There's no denying that sequences like the 960 were responsible for fundamentally shaping the sound of artists like Tangerine Dream back in the 70s. So personally, I think it is amazing that we can get our hands on Eurorack recreations of those modules, and we can firsthand experience that whole creative process that Tangerine Dream, people like Edgar Froza and Chris Frank went through back in the day when they created some of the most iconic synthesizer music of all time. But let's not kid ourselves that it's only Behringer that have dared to recreate these Moog modules. Moog modular systems have been cloned and copied and recreated or even just inspired full-size recreations countless times over the decades. The vast majority of those recreations are expensive, exclusive and full-sized replicas.
Now, thankfully, there's only been a couple of occasions in my short career as a YouTuber where I would have appreciated wearing one of these. It's a flak jacket. Um, but I get the feeling that maybe this video is going to be another occasion where I might need a flak jacket. And the reason I say that is because I'm about to touch upon some negatives of these modules. And negatives means criticism. And criticism is not going to be of Behringer's implementation of these modules. It's actually going to be a criticism about the original designs of these modules. Uh, the original Bob Moog designs. So uh, I do appreciate that that's not going to go down with some people. Um, but I think that, you know, having used these modules for months now, uh, you know, next to more modern modules, I think that uh, what I'm about to, to tell you uh, could hopefully be of use to you if you're thinking about um, you know, investing in these modules. Uh, I don't think that they are modules really for a beginner, put it that way. Um, now, I am 101% um, appreciative of the fact that these original uh, Moog modular systems, you know, they were designed in the 60s and then into the 70s, right at the very birth of musical synthesis. There were no standards, there were no naming conventions. Um, so they are what they are, basically. You know, we've seen the weird naming conventions on the envelope generators, the T1, T2, T3, E sus. Uh, we've seen uh, resonance being called regeneration on the filter module. Um, there's something weird called a clamping point that's on uh, one of the oscillator modules. Uh, there's some really weird stuff going on on the interface module, some stuff that I don't even know what's going on with those. Uh, there, are, you know, there, there are occasions when you're using these modules where it feels more like a scientific instrument than a musical instrument and there's you know there's no surprise to that really Bob Moog was not a musician he was an engineer um, and that really shines through in the in the interface the user interface to these modules uh, recreated by Behringer um, but that's not my real main uh, bugbear with these because you get to know you know you, you use them and you get to know what what the controls do the whole S trig versus V trig, the lack of standards back in the 60s and 70s uh, that we now have with these Behringer System 55 uh, you know, recreations here, uh, they are a real pain, I have to say, a real pain. You've got these two modules that need S trig. The envelope generator, which is a pretty critical uh, module, I have to say, and then this dual delay module. They both need S trig, but everything else is happy with V trig. You've got the sequencer and the sequential switch. They're very happy to accept V-Trigs and give out V-Trigs. It's just these two modules that stubbornly need S-Trig. And so you're going to need that 961 interface module. And it's a big module. If I show you my, my little three-tier Moog rack here again. Right, so as much as ever, uh, rack space is at a premium in a little setup like this. And that's the 961. Look how huge it is. It's the biggest module by far here. Uh, and I need it purely to convert a V-Trig from the Mother32 sequencer into S-Trig so I can trigger an envelope generator with it. I need this great big module here just for that one single purpose. It's a real pain to have to have it in every setup. It takes up a lot of room. And it's not the only module that takes up a lot of room. If you want, I'll just check my list here, if you want to access some fixed voltages, minus six volts, plus six volts, you're gonna need the CP35 attenuators module. That is a huge module. Just for that one purpose, if you want it for some voltages, it's a big, 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 big module. It really is big. Uh, the mixer module is quite large for what it does. The filter bank is obviously huge, and the sequencer is gigantic. It needs a case all of its own, almost. Um, so, you know, there are some big modules here. They take up a lot of room. You really need to consider that when you're building up your system. Um, but my biggest issue, I think, is the lack of functionality that there is with this collection. Even though we have 22 modules here, uh, there are some glaring uh, missing functionalities that there is no sample and hold. Uh, there is no ring mod circuit. 
Um, there is no portamento glide slew functionality. Now maybe there was built into the keyboard because uh, I think the original mo uh, uh, modular systems had a keyboard. Maybe that was in there, but it's not there in a module. So there's none of that going on. What else? There's no LFO. There's no dedicated LFO. If you want an LFO to modulate anything, you're going to need to use one of the oscillators. In fact, there's only one oscillator you can use. It's the 921. It's a big module. Again, if you just want to use it as an LFO, it takes up a lot of room compared to modern Eurorack modules that we have these days. So, you know, again, you've got premium rack space requirements here and you've got missing functionality and it's a big big shame and obviously it's not just missing uh, in in Behringer's recreation it was missing there in the original Moog designs um, so I think you need to bear in mind all of those things when you're looking at this system but most of all I think it's it's actually when you start to patch and you start to realize how you're going to need to patch these modules together, what modules you're going to need, that's when you really get an appreciation of how much rack space you're gonna need and what modules you're gonna to need to purchase. Um, and that's a process that I've been going through for several months now, which is why I've gone from you know, big racks to smaller racks and I've been swapping modules in and out over and over and over again, figuring out what I really need. So what I'm gonna do now for you is I'm gonna take you through just a few different patching examples, uh, just how you would use the System 55 modules to, to patch a specific piece of functionality uh, to generate the specific sounds. Um, and I'm gonna compare and contrast how you would do it with the System 55 modules to another set of modules that Behringer have produced, the System 100. Now, the System 100 modules, uh, based on the 100M from Roland, they are incredibly convenient. They're very, very well thought out. They have the musician in mind from the very, very start. Now, Roland produced the 100M, I think it was in 1979. So in terms of their, you know, their, their modular systems uh, compared to the competition like, like Moog and ARP, um, Roland came out with theirs quite late in the day. Roland had already produced a number of keyboards and synthesizers uh, for musicians to use. So they had a very, very good idea about uh, what, how a musician would like to use uh, a modular system. And they built an awful lot of conveniences into the System 100M. And those conveniences are there in bearing a System 100. So uh, hopefully this is going to be interesting for you uh, to compare and contrast how you patch something with a System 100 versus how you patch it with the System 55. Now clearly it's not a choice of this or this. It's just me showing you the kind of things you're going to have to think about when it comes to the System 55 that you might be taking for granted if you've already got a System 100 or in fact any modern uh, Eurorack uh, modules. So that is what's coming up next.
Okay, so let's start really, really simply with this patch. We're going to take two oscillators and combine the signal from both those oscillators and apply them to our low pass filter. Now, as you'll see here, the low pass filter only has a single signal input. So we're going to need to use a mixer module. That mixer module is going to take the output from VCO number one and from VCO number two. We can then set the levels, attenuate those levels and then apply the output from the mixer to the low pass filter. Very, very simple, but we've used here four modules. Okay, so let's apply the same patching to the System 100 modules. So we start off with a 112 module. It's got two oscillators in it, so that's great. And we need a filter. So we're gonna use the 121 filter module. It's got two filters in it. We only need one of them. Now in terms of patching, all we do is take an output from VCO number one into the VCF and an output from VCO number two into the VCF. And that's all we need to do because you'll see here that the VCF has got attenuators on all of its inputs. And that is the same across the whole range of modules. There are attenuators on all of the inputs. It's really, really convenient. So here we've only had to use two modules. Okay, so let's go back to our System 55 patch and extend it a little bit. Now what I want to do now is to modulate the filter cutoff with an envelope. So let's add our envelope generator. And to be complete, let's add our interface module as well because we're dealing with S-Trig here. So we're gonna need an interface module, the 961 module to give S-Trig to our envelope generator. So we'll patch the S-Trig cable in now, in terms of modulating the filter with the envelope generator, we could just patch directly between the envelope generator and the filter. But from my experience, you really want to be able to attenuate that modulation uh, to get it just right. It's rare that I would actually be using full envelope generator CV into a low pass filter. So we're going to need to add an attenuators module. We'll use this little module here, the 995. And then what we need to do is take our output from our envelope generator into one of those attenuators and then the output from that attenuator into our filter. And that's it. Now we've got our envelope generator modulating our filter and we can attenuate and adjust the amount of that modulation. Okay, so let's try the same thing with the System 100 modules. We're gonna to need to add an envelope generator module. This is the 140 and it's got two envelope generators and again, we only need to use one of them. So we'll ignore the second envelope. Patching it is very, very simple. We just take an envelope output from that first envelope and we patch it to that first VCF. Um, and as you'll see here, all of the inputs to the VCF, the same with all the modules. They are attenuated, so we don't need any further modules, any external attenuators, anything like that. It's as simple as that, one cable. Okay, so going back to our System 55 patch, let's extend it again. This time, let's add an LFO. So not only are we going to modulate our filter with the envelope, but we're also going to modulate it with an LFO. Let's see how we do that. So adding an LFO means we need to add an oscillator, one of these 921 oscillators. You can flick a little switch and go into sub mode for low frequencies. So that's our LFO. Now there are actually two ways of patching it. We're gonna to want to attenuate that LFO signal going into our low pass filter. We can either use one of the spare attenuators on that 995 module, as I'm showing there with the blue cables, but the 921 has an attenuator built in if we use the auxiliary outputs over here on the right hand side. So we can actually just take a cable straight from the auxiliary output into our filter and we've got an aux out level which attenuates that signal on the 921 itself. So that's a quite simple patch. So let's apply that LFO with our System 100 modules and it's an even simpler patch actually because it just happens that we have an LFO built into that 140 envelope module. So all we need to do is just take a cable from the LFO output straight into our VCF and it's attenuated like we mentioned before. So that's it, just one more cable. 
Okay, so there's one final thing I'd like to try with these patches, just to extend them a little bit further. What I want to do is to have that LFO modulation, a gradual onset, a delayed LFO, rather than having it working all the time. So what I mean by that is, each time I press down a key, play a note, there'll be a small delay before the LFO takes effect. Now the way that we're going to patch this is using an envelope generator. So the first thing I need to do is just remove a couple of cables, because I'm going to have to repatch them, and I'm going to explain what I'm doing a little bit later on. So let's remove a couple of cables, shrink it down to give us room, and let's add our envelope generator. So we're going to give our second envelope generator here a slow attack to modulate the LFO amount that's being applied to the filter. So we need to trigger this second envelope generator exactly the same as we're triggering the first envelope generator. So we need to take our S-trig out from our interface module and apply it to both envelope generators at the same time. So I'm going to take an S-trig output and go into one of the multiples that is there in the mixer module. And then from that multiple, I'm going to patch to both of the envelope generators. So now my S-trig output is being applied to both envelope generators at the same time. So that's the first part of the patching done. Now to modulate the LFO control voltage that's being applied to the filter. Now the way that we're going to do that is to go via a voltage controlled amplifier. First step is to take our LFO control voltage and pass it into our amplifier. And then take it out from our amplifier into our filter. So if our amplifier is fully turned up, uh, we're just applying our LFO constantly to our filter cutoff. But now what we're going to do is modulate our amplifier using our second envelope, like that. Now you could say technically we should attenuate that uh, envelope signal going into the amplifier, but I think it's absolutely fine to have it going straight directly from envelope into amplifier, because you either want no LFO being applied at all, or you want a maximum, and we're already attenuating our LFO amount, the maximum amount anyway, if you follow me. But anyway, that's it. That's all the patching needed to apply a delayed onset LFO to our filter cutoff every time we play a note. Okay, so let's apply that same delayed LFO to our System 100 patch. And I'm being a little bit cheeky here because I know <laughs> already it's so, so simple to do. I don't actually have to do any extra patching. Uh, the LFO has a slider on it called delay, and you can delay the onset of the LFO without doing any extra patching. Well, that's not quite true. You're going to have to trigger that LFO. There's a little trigger input there. So we would have to provide a trigger input to it the same way that we're supplying a gate input to our envelope. Um, but that would be the only patching necessary, but very, very simple otherwise. Okay, so let's compare those patches on those two different sets of modules, starting off with the System 100. As we can see here, very, very simple, three modules and four patch cables. And even then, we've got a filter too many and an envelope too many. Um, but when we compare that to the System 55, we see it's a lot more complicated. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten modules. And I think we've got 11 cables there. I'm pretty sure it's 11 cables. Now, I know it's a cheeky example, especially with the LFO being delayed. Uh, it's so simple to do on the System 100, and it's not so simple to do on the System 55. But, you know, what I'm trying to show you here is that the System 100 modules are so convenient. There are attenuators on all of the inputs. Uh, there are little mini mixers in there as well. And you know, when you look at modern uh, Eurorack modules, you'll see that they're very convenient. There's lots of attenuators there for you to use. And with the System 55, there are no attenuators on the inputs at all. You have to use extra modules to attenuate signals before you apply them to oscillators or filters or VCAs or whatever else you're applying them to. Um, so you really need to think hard about what modules you're going to need, how many extra attenuators and mixers and multiples you're going to need to complete your collection.
Okay, so just a few more things I wanted to mention relating to the System 55 collection of modules from Beringer. Uh, now, I know I've already gone on about this whole S-Trig thing and about the fact that you need the interface module to convert a V-Trig to an S-Trig and how the interface module is so large and blah, 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 blah. Um, I just wanted to say that I've done a, a fairly extensive amount of searching on the internet for an alternative to the interface module. I just assumed that someone else will have made a little tiny slim module that takes V-Trigs and turns them into S-Trigs. Surely someone's done that and I couldn't find anything at all. Um, so there's an opportunity for someone, please create that module. But what I did find was these cables, these blue cables, they're one meter long. What they've got on one end is a little 3.5 millimeter mini jacks and on the other end they've got quarter inch jacks. Um, and now they're not just going from one size to the other, there are apparently some little electrical components inside these quarter inch jacks here. And what they do magically is take V-Trig at this end and turn it into S-Trig at this end. Um, these are made by Dopefer and they were made so that you could use your wonderful Dopefer modules, take your V-Trigs out of your Dopefer modules and put them into a certain Korg synthesizer because unfortunately Korg and Yamaha and Moog all decided to use S-Trig as their standard back in the 70s. So that's what these cables are for. If you want to search for them online, look for Korg S-Trig Dopefer. Hopefully you'll find them. I, maybe I bought the last four, I don't know. Uh, I have tried these out, they do work, they work really, really well. I'm very happy with them. The only downsides are you're going to have to put an adapter on the end here to take your quarter inch jack back down to 3.5 uh, millimeter size, which is a pain. Uh, and the other downside is, well, the cost of them. They're over 20 pounds each for each of these cables, which is a lot of money for a cable but it does have some wizardry magic components inside here. So I thought I'd mention those. That's an alternative to using the interface module. Um, one final thing that I wanted to mention, um, because as I was using the System 55 modules to write music with, I kind of realized that I was retuning the oscillators quite a lot. So I decided to do a test, and that test for me is Make sure all of the modules are nice and cold. Switch on the case uh, from cold. Immediately measure the tuning of the oscillators and then re-measure the tuning every 15 minutes for a good few hours. And let's see what the results are. So I'm gonna show you this little spreadsheet here. This is for one of the 921 modules, but it was pretty similar for all of the modules in my case that I tested. Um, and what you've got here is on the x-axis, you have got uh, time. So every 15 minutes going out to four hours, I did this for. And then on the y-axis, the vertical axis, you've got pitch in cents. So you can see here, as soon as you switch on um, the, the modules, power them up, 
the 921 jumps up in pitch and it jumps up in pitch by quite a lot but this is absolutely normal for a voltage control oscillator they all leap about in terms of pitch uh, as soon as you switch them on and they start to warm up it's very very normal I've seen many of them do this and go up like this one does I've seen them go down I've seen them oscillate up and down all over the place this is quite normal very normal now the thing I wanted to mention really is the amount of time it takes for the oscillator to reach a stable pitch um, and for me with all of my 921s and 921A plus B combinations uh, you're going to have to wait a good two hours to get that stable pitch if you look at that vertical line there uh, where it's got 120, 120 minutes, that's two hours, you'll see there at that point it really has started to stabilise. It's going to drift a little bit, you know, but within say five cents over the next couple of hours it's really not very much at all, uh, hardly noticeable five cents. But, uh, you know, if you really don't want to keep retuning your oscillators then do wait a good two hours for them to warm up. I know it's a long time, it's a long time compared to a lot of my other oscillators that I use, um, but it seems to be the way it is. And I've talked to other people that have got Behringer System 55 modules, and for them too, about two hours is the right time. So you must really bear that in mind. Otherwise, you're gonna have to keep you know, adjusting and retuning your oscillators. It's not the end of the world to do that. I'll just show you what I use uh, to tune my oscillators with. I've got a little hand tuner this little one here there are plenty of them to choose from um, this one's just got a little cable in with a 3.5 millimeter jack on the end and I just plug it into my and make sure I know what note my oscillators are playing I plug it in to one of the waveforms in each oscillator and I can tune it very very quickly using one of these things this is this is really really easy to do uh, but you know you can get digital tuners you can get actual tuner modules uh, so you can put them in your case and then connect them up to your oscillators and tune them that way but I really would recommend uh, a little tuner so that you can you know keep retuning your oscillators um, unless you want to wait the full two hours for them to stabilize now obviously this two hours depends on humidity and uh, temperature etc 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 but it is going to be quite a long time so that's really the last thing that I wanted to mention um, on my list of positives and negatives. It's a negative, but it's it's not really a negative. It's just something to bear in mind. Um, I'm going to come up with some final thoughts very, very soon. So, if these System 55 modules are less easy and less convenient to use than many other Eurorack modules out there, then why bother? You know, Beringer will always have their haters, their doubters, the people who will say that these modules cannot possibly sound like the originals, not at that price. 
And you know what? I get the impression from all my research on the Moog Modular Originals and having had discussions with people that own them, that that is probably the case. You know, the original Moog modules were hand-soldered, calibrated, checked, and recalibrated. You set the attack time to 100 milliseconds and you get 100 milliseconds. They are a labor of love, precision at its best. These Behringer modules cannot possibly have that level of attention or that level of precision, not at the price they sell for, and we honestly shouldn't expect it. But what we can expect is a collection of beautiful sounding modules to totally immerse yourself in, to integrate with your other gear, or maybe to build your own remake of an original system that your musician heroes once used. For me, very personally, Beringer have once again provided remakes that have woken up my passion for the original. And although those originals are completely out of my grasp and probably always will be, at least I can always dream.